everybody to the JP Dub podcast, the first episode of 2023. Why did it take us so many months? I don't fucking know, but maybe you'll figure out later. With us tonight, we have the one, the only, he's a fucking acclaimed author in the horror world. He's also the fucking founder and guitarist of one of the most brutal fucking death metal bands you could ever fucking imagine. It broke it up. We got the one, the only, Jeremy. Jeremy, how are you That's doing? That's got to be one of the sickest intros anyone's ever done for me for any interview. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. I fucking appreciate it, dude. Right I'm on. super psyched. Dude, tonight, and, and what a fucking kawinky dink that tonight happens to be as of this recording. You people are probably listening on any podcasting platform on a later day or watching on mm -hmm. YouTube right now. Like, subscribe, and share, motherfuckers. But it's the 28th anniversary of fucking Repulsive Conception. That's right. And in honor of that, Justin, I actually have my vintage uh, Repulsive Ooh. Conception Ooh. long sleeve from 1995. Oh, oh, man. So, so happy, happy birthday, Repulsive Conception. Fuck yeah. Damn. So badass. years today. So yeah. fucking great, wow. dude. I, I was going to wear great. mine, but unfortunately, I'm behind the green screen. You would have seen right through my guts and shit. <laughs> <laughs> fucking weird. Floating head. <laughs> but, uh, dude, that's a good kicking off point for tonight, man. Let's take us back 28 years to... Mm -hmm. uh, what I believe uh, you guys did your first couple albums digitally, and you were like the first death metal band to record digitally. Um, mm -hmm. And then you go into the analog, the traditional, more traditional sense of recording for this album. Take us back to those times during that. Yeah, sure. So uh, when we did the first two albums, our uh, old guitar player, Brian Griffin, who recorded, engineered, produced, did all of our recording, Brian was working full time at a recording studio in uh, Gurney, Illinois. I'm sure uh, Bruiser Bodie there knows Gurney. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was like our backyard. That's where I went to high school in Gurney, Illinois. And that's where, for the longest time, Broken Hope was based out of where we would rehearse. And uh, we even had the old fan club address at a P.O. box in Gurney. So, uh, it was so convenient. Brian Griffin worked at that studio. It was called Wave Digital. And at the time, they had um, this recording hardware that was uh, digital at the time. It was state of the art. And it was um, the actual tapes. When you think of digital now, you think of software and Pro Tools and all that stuff. But digital back then was these digital tapes and stuff. So they're like eight millimeter videotapes almost. And it was an Akai ADAM system is what it was called. And yeah, like dad, um, did you say like dad, and, something like that. Uh, it, it wasn't not that, but a, a dam that there is that tape that you, you know, master or mix down to, but um, this was a completely state of the art system. And we, did our we actually did our second demo and um like a kind of like a pre-production demo for Swamp and Gore oh, in that wow. same studio digitally and then when it came time to do Swamp and Gore we we did it there we had the luxury of again having a guy in the band who worked there full time and he got us in there on off hours and we were able to have more time than a lot of bands would, you know, with a small budget to really maximize days and weeks to re record this thing. So um, anyway, yeah, that said, the first two albums we did for Metal Blade were done at Wave Digital. They were digital um, albums. And to your point, Justin, yeah, somewhere out there is a trivia fact, like Broken Hopes, the first death metal band to record a di digital album digital death metal right <laughs> so we by the time repulsive conception was being recorded brian had moved 
um, away from Wave Digital. In fact, I think Wave Digital was sold and the new owner didn't stay in business long as some guy wanted to own a recording studio, didn't know what he was doing, and it, it just went out the window really quick. So by that time, Brian, he was already looking ahead for his own career and what he was going to want to do. So he uh, worked at a, 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 this guy owned a private studio on his property. He had a house, separate building for a recording studio. That studio was analog, two inch tape. And Brian started working on it there. And then um, the guy who owned the studio in the house actually rented the house to Brian. And then um, like not long after that, like Brian and I actually became roommates. I used to live at the house with Brian where the studio was at. And then Brian named the studio Qualitone Studios. And that was the first uh, album we did analog, which was Repulsive Conception. Still holds up just like all your fucking albums, dude. You guys like to me, oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like there'd be like no dying fetus. None of a lot of these fucking bands without you guys. And, and I, I remember meeting John Gallagher for the first time when we were on tour for the Loathing album. We played at um, fuck yeah, a club called Twisters in Richmond, Virginia. Twisters. And John John Gallagher came out, and I think maybe uh, that would have been ninety seven. I don't know all the dates and releases for dying fetus, but I think maybe they had their first album or something out and he came out, but he, he sang uh swamp and gore. Oh, us on stage. That was awesome. pretty cool. And then, uh, dying fetus actually did a broken hope cover of gore hog. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. EP, but, um, I really love John Gallagher. He's such a great dude and just a uh, great band too. So, but really, really great. But, uh, yeah, you know, the third album is 28 years old and we've been around a lot longer than that. So as time goes on, you find out, I don't know, bands that you may have influenced that are, you know, around and big and kicking ass, you know? Well, yeah, like it, that. hugely. And, and dude, my band, handsome prick and moistened disciples and decrypt. And, and I'm sure Bodie can attest the oh, same yeah. thing, dude. You know, we're all Midwest guys. You guys were, <clears throat> Maybe the same, right? But I mean, you guys were fucking like we're talking about albums from like Cannibal that were fucking brutal at the time, like the bleeding and all that shit. Mm -hmm. But then here comes Broken Hope, and this shit is just as if not more fucking brutal. And it's from the Midwest, man. That's yeah. you know, that's mm -hmm. that's where it's at. Everybody Held wants to groove. look out to the east and west coast for shit, dude. But come we, on, we dude. always I, I I personally have always taken a lot of pride in being this. Midwest death metal band, you Fuck know, yeah. and around the world were known as, you know, this Chicago pioneering death metal band. You know, I always like to say Chicago land because, you know, we started <laughs> out in the burbs and some of us to this day, like me, live in the burbs up there. The rest of the guys are in the city. So, um, you know, it's uh, like that it, it, Chicago area joke, you know, people that say i'm from the city you know and they live in <laughs> elk grove village or lake zurich or something but, or northwest but, indiana or northwest indiana and uh, but i i do take pride in being a band known for being from chicago and being from the midwest and bands in chicago before us that you know were really doing stuff if even before us if you think about master and burn green even and 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 macabre for damn sure oh and, yeah um they were representing that chicago extreme metal scene and were really unique and real you know pioneers and stuff and they, when we started and relevant to all that when we started it broken hope in 1988 in 1988 like Oh, like for this style of death metal, if you will, OG death metal, like uh, we started in 88. Then in New York, you had bands like Immolation. They also formed in 1988, Suffocation 88, Cannibal Corpse, Buffalo, New York, 1988, on and on. Um, we just really 
wanted to be like the death metal band uh, representing the Midwest because that's where our roots are. That's where we're from. And, and just in general, though, like being a, 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 a in my late teens and early 20s, I was always just flying the flag of death metal super high, like 1988, um, you know, just getting out of high school when I was playing death metal, I was into all these death metal bands, extreme metal bands. No one in my high school listened to any of that stuff in Gurney. All the people that were in bands in Gurney were in cover bands. That's Probably all. Like some Duran and they would always, <laughs> these schoolmates that were in bands would, you know, look down on me like, what what's that shit? What kind of vocals are that? You know, same shit, you know, people's parents would say, what's yeah. that? You know, like these are classmates playing fucking public songs and shit. <laughs> like it's like you guys don't get. It. I was already tape trading, connected to the death metal underground, okay. and um, I'm like, you guys have no fucking idea what exactly it is you know. And look, um, and death metal, you know, it 2023 now is seeped into every nook and cranny of life from popular culture and movies yeah. to mm-hmm. elsewhere, you know, but I still fly the death metal flag high. And again, being from Chicago, uh, land, Chicago, Chicago land, being from the Midwest, um, that's just woven into my heart and soul. And I've done fests like Maryland death fest yep. where people in the pit, um, are literally in the pit with a Chicago flag and shit, like makes you really happy, you know? So, um, my track record in interviews and part of my angle that I've repeated over and over is like, I never forget where I came from in any respect. I don't forget where I came from as a death metal musician being from the Midwest. And I just don't forget where I come from in general you know, as yep. life goes on, I always hold on to that. So, um, again, just proud to represent, you know, I can go to Japan, I could go to Bogota, Colombia, anywhere in the world and fans and people know like broken hope, Chicago, you know, like yeah. it's a thing, you know, <laughs> very proud of it. You Fuck know? Yeah. As you should be yes, brother. You definitely should be dude. So early on when, when you start playing and I like, Cause, dude, I'm a, like, we do, like I said, we do the uh, wrestling show and shit too, and I'm a huge buff for like the history of things and great appreciation for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Chicago Land has a a really great, rich history in professional wrestling as well. But, um, mm-hmm. and just in the music scene, man, and and death metal because it's like it's this thing we wear on our fucking sleeve. Once you get hooked into it, and you know, once you go on the road, you meet all these people and you develop these relationships and maybe unbeknownst to the people that aren't involved in it but it is a really good community that takes care of each other you know mm-hmm. in, in spite of people singing about ripping your fucking guts out and doing this <laughs> and that you know but like people are fucking really awesome um what what were you listening to to kind of get you motivated in guitar and shit as a young kid in high school and and weren't you and joe uh we we call used to call him Joe because we could never really pronounce his name really oh, good. But Joe Tachi, yeah, yeah, we used to call him Joe Patacha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what were you guys fucking rocking out to, man? Like what what fucking slapped you in the face one day and you're like, holy shit, dude, this is me. This is where my heart lies. Well, uh, when I started out, by the way, uh, the name Thachek, P T A C E K. Uh, that's from Joe's ancestry. They're Czech, Czech, Czech Slovakia, now Czech Republic. And uh, Ta Czech means a uh, little bird in uh, Czech. He, totally he, opposite. <laughs> yeah, he, 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 uh, he told me that years ago. And I actually met a woman who was in the horror uh, fiction community, and her last name was Ta Czech. And she's the only person I ever met with that last name. And I'm like, um, hey, my singer his his last name is thought check too and and then she's like you know that my name means little bird in check i'm like yeah he he told me that but anyway a little trivia for you there but (laughs) when i was uh younger like around age 12 13 i knew i wanted like i wanted a guitar 
I was always fascinated with the guitar. I had, a, had an aunt who was a, a folk singer, guitar player, and I was just fascinated by watching her play. Like, wow, how do you, know, how, how do you make those sounds come out of that instrument? It was really cool to me. And my mom got me uh, my first guitar, which was like a Epiphone acoustic guitar. And, uh, um, you know, beggars can't be choosers. I begged her for a guitar, but I wanted an electric guitar, but I ended up with an acoustic. And it was hey, kind build of, up that finger strength, brother. My, my mom's like, yeah, she's like, well, start on this and it, we'll see if you, you like it. We'll we'll go from there. And like a lot of typical kids, I actually screwed around for it and didn't take it seriously. And it just sat around a long time. Then around that same time I discovered like Judas priest um, screaming for vengeance had just come out and um, uh, all these other hard rock and metal bands. So I was starting to <clears throat> get into metal, you know, and stuff more and more. And by the time I hit my teens, Around 1985, I was full in on on metal, uh, but I was still on a on a big learning curve. You know, I was in the, the uh, bands like I was saying, Priest. I can remember it was like Judas Priest, um, Crocus was a band I had albums from, um, some Iron Maiden. Um, uh, the, this band, you guys ever hear the band Zebra? They were like, they I've had, heard that name. I don't they, think they I've had ever a few heard albums anything. out. Hmm. Their first album was they had an MTV video was on all the time. I was really into those guys and um, some Sabbath, Armored Saint for sure. The first Armored Saint album, yeah. Arch of the Saint, and 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 I was just oh uh, the band uh, Pile Driver. I remember really. Being into them, Metal Inquisition. Hell yeah! <laughs> um, so I was just trying to eat up metal and metal and watch. And back back then, when MTV was a real music video channel, there was always <clears throat> a lot of hard rock and, and metal stuff, you know. So I'd get turned on all these bands. So anyway, um, I was getting more and more into metal, and I kind of my tastes for are yearning for more heavier and heavier yeah. bands like. You know, that's why I started discovering Motorhead and stuff. And um, so right around 1985, um, no, 80, 84, 85, uh, I had a skateboarder buddy that I always hung out with. He was like a skateboard punk guy. And I was I was like, I was not a skateboarder. I was a BMX guy. So I raced BMX and stuff, but we, him and I shared uh, a love for metal. And this guy, this punk kid, his parents were like university professors. Um, the town I grew up in, and I don't know, Bruiser being from Wisconsin, I don't know if you know the town of Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Yes. It's right in the middle, dead center middle of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So that's where I grew up in grade school in junior high and so it was around it's a university town so this kid this punk rock kid i hung out with his parents were like i think university teachers or professors and um i thought they were rich because this kid i go to his house he had like 200 cassette tapes right <laughs> and like for me uh being the son of a single mom raising two kids like you know, rubbing two pennies together was right. hard enough. So buying a cassette tape was like one cassette tape was like a big deal for me, saving up money just to buy one cassette. This guy had 200 cassettes like his parents bought. So I'm like, man, you must be rich. You know, it's it pretty funny in hindsight, but he had all these tapes and he was really cool about recording his tapes for me. And so I'm watching MTV one day and it would, by this time it was 1985 and, and it was uh it was like um I think it was called they had a two hour special or something called Metal Mania live from Day on the Green in Oakland California and it was uh Scorpions 
YNT, uh, Yingbe Malmsteen, and Metallica. And I had seen Metallica albums like on vinyl at the record store and stuff, but didn't never bought them. And I see a clip on a, right before a commercial break of Metallica playing. They're like, um, I looked it up because everything's on YouTube now. So yeah, I've yeah. gone down memory lane off my memory. Like, I know I saw this and sure enough, I found it. And they're, it's like it's just a clip of them a couple seconds and they're playing Fight Fire with Fire. And then it, yeah. then it goes from that to Lars and James, like saying, hey, this is Lars, this is James from Metallica. You're watching Metal Mania or whatever. So I was like, just those couple seconds, I'm like, holy shit, I've never seen a band that looked like that or played like that just a couple seconds that's all it took to like get in my head and i remember going to that punk rock kid friend of mine who had all these tapes of everyone and um and i i remember going do you have any tapes by that band uh metal Licka? <laughs> I, I couldn't remember I how to say their name to say like you ever heard and, of pantera <laughs> yeah and he's like you mean Metallica? Yeah. And at that time, there there was only Kill Em All and Ride the Lightning. Right. So um, we went to his house, and he actually said, here, jam on, we'll jam on this, and I'll, I'll dub you uh, these albums. And he put on Ride the Lightning, mm. and it you know, opens with that acoustic intro and goes into Fight yes. Fire. It was like one song after another, and I was just in his basement room just friggin floored i just couldn't believe what i was hearing it just blew me away like i'll never it's like you could talk to your parents or grandparents where were you when jfk got assassinated yeah where were you on 9 11 that we all and where were you when you first heard metallica it was like i i'll never forget it everything i was doing because it changed my life that's when I'm like, um, I I really want to be make a band and be a guitar player. I want to play that. So I took that acoustic guitar my mom got me that was still laying around, traded it in for my first electric guitar, and then and then two things happened. I took guitar more seriously, and then I was just seeking out more and more extreme metal. The next thing you know, like right after. Not long after I uh, had that Metallica experience, uh, Master of Puppets came out like the next year. And then, you know, it was all the Slayer stuff, Dark yes. Angel, everything I could get my hands on that was heavier and heavier. And I was started taking guitar lessons. I started writing lyrics too. I never had any inclination to be a singer or anything. Um, funny enough, I was so motivated and wanting to be in a band um i would even i did try out as a singer for bands but you know my my heart was really into just being a guitar player so anyway um and then you know like senior senior junior senior years of high school and i started discovering you know death metal and stuff you know i'd already been turned on to like celtic frost and yeah they're really heavy and then, you know, death came along and um, it just on and on. But the thing about what I was into, uh, like, get, especially getting more into death metal, getting into the underground for me, Broken Hope by 1988, Joe Thacek, we lived in the same neighborhood. We formed Broken Hope together with Ryan Stanek, our drummer, was the three of us, the founding fathers of Broken Hope. Um uh, Joe is really into punk rock and punk and hardcore. Fuck so yeah. GBA, I just saw Black Flag over the weekend. The it was crazy. Yeah, Black Flag. Ryan Stanek, too. He uh, was into uh, the Dead Kennedys a lot. Fuck and, yeah. It's um, like Hanneman, dude. So, um, yeah. Uh, Ryan used to always wear this white uh, Dead Kennedy shirt, Holiday in Cambodia. He wore that all the time. And so Joe was turning me on to some punk punk and hardcore bands i hadn't heard of i was turning those guys on more on to on death metal stuff um i also got advances of albums 
through friends too. So like I got the first Paradise Lost album on a cassette before it came out. That that's still one of my favorite albums. Some some carcass stuff, you know, you name it. Even demos of some of those bands. Like um I had like the Deicide de- demos when they were Amon and wow, you know, yeah. of course I was by that time I was really good friends with Ross Dolan of Immolation, who to this day is one of my dearest friends. And he he was really like Mr. Underground and he would turn me on the bands, send me demo tapes and cassettes and all this stuff. And he he also helped Broken Hope a lot with provide me lists of fanzines to send our demos to and stuff. But anyway, I, I mentioned all that, that, that my metal history and, and that evolution uh, and, and finally getting with Joe and Ryan to where all these different influences and what we were into were one rubbing off on each other, but um, collectively making a, a mission to make Broken Hope like this pure you know, an unyielding, brutal as hell death metal band. That was the goal from from day one. And um, just uncompromising. The other thing is, um, when it comes to Joe and his vocals, like, I, I wish he was here to see, like, the fans and everything who really worship him. And a lot of the... a lot of I the, wish he was here to a, kick a, Chris Barnes' ass. A lot, a lot of the bands, you know, and stuff, like... Um, newer bands, uh, up and coming bands, like saying with Sugabog, you know, yes. who Devin, uh, Swank from saying with Sugabog, um, he's become a good friend of mine and to have these younger, younger, new yet old school death metal minded bands is really cool. And to hear how much, not just that they love broken hope, but even like Joe's, you know, style of singing, the thing with Joe, too, as part of that mission to be really brutal from day one with Broken Hope was after listening to uh, albums from Death and Obituary and and these bands that we love, Joe was always like, well, uh, you know, basically I'm going to make it a mission to be guttural. Like I never even heard the term guttural used. It's used everywhere now, but Joe was like, I'm going to be guttural and I want to be sicker than Chuck Schaldiner or John Tardy. Yeah, because they were all the high pitch and, and, guys. And, and and that's like, and that's pure love for those guys, you know. Right, those, right. In fact, they're um, the vocalists that that we love. But Joe was just like, I this band needs to be heavy on every level, and that was part of the mission statement. Just with him from a vocal approach, you know, he's the guy who. Uh, self-proclaimed himself esophagus, you know. You're the guitar <laughs> yeah. player, you're the drummer, you're the bass player, and I'm the esophagus. You know? <laughs> yes. That's that's and then we just the missions remain the same uh with me and you know the, the broken hope of 2023 is still to always deliver uncompromising, extremely brutal death metal broken hopes brand death metal you know what i mean that's, yeah and the last two records yeah. i think have shown that you know i mean there's mm-hmm. it's not like you wouldn't you you haven't missed a beat you know and it's and it's been progressive as well it's still the core of what broken hope is but then some you know like you can tell <clears throat> you guys have grown well i should say you because you know everybody else i mean other than like damien you know and gorgasm and shit but uh mm-hmm. dude i i I think Joe is probably the most underrated fucking death metal vocalist of all time, as the macho man would say. <laughs> the dude, I, I, me and my drummer Brad constantly listen to fucking you guys, you know, and it's always just it's such a treat to throw you guys on here. That motherfucker just the most fucking brutal shit ever. Mm-hmm. Shit that'll make you turn around, punch your mother in the face because it's so fucking heavy, <laughs> dude. Like. <laughs> Like I said, you know, I joke around like I wish he was still here so he could kick Chris Barnes' ass because, you know, the anal cunt song actually lived up to its <laughs> fucking thing. But uh, none, you know, to quote Cryptopsy, I mean, their Lord Warren was none so vile, but with Joe, there's like none so brutal, you know, like I, I fucking love his 
fucking vocals and his delivery. It's just so heavy. I don't think it can get any heavier without sacrificing something, you know, like there, <laughs> he's the be yeah. all end all to me as a 40 year old man. Now that like, yeah, I always dug you guys, but the older I got more experienced I got in doing death metal and grind vocals and shit. Like mm-hmm. I take a little bit from everybody. Um, and dude, mm-hmm. he's like the man for me now, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah, fuck, dude. Yeah, totally. Totally yeah. influential on my vocals too. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. I, Joe would be proud to hear and that makes me happy to hear with Joe. Um, especially with, you know, like when you hear a band's music and everything and how everybody, how everything's married up, if you yeah. will, like you take a band like System of a Down, those yeah. are some unique vocals. Sometimes the music there's certain songs that are real heavy. Like I could imagine like, uh, like on that system of a down song aerials, like I, uh, this, that end riff is real heavy. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I could imagine super heavy vocals, but you don't get that out of the singer. And uh, I use that as a weird analogy because with broken hope, we just, seem to make it work always make it work like the the joe's vocals match up what the music's about yeah with the heaviest the fucking are, low ends you know, and fucking you know, just like oh, groove you know. and eat in the yeah. off groove, weird off timey sure. fucking riffs dude oh my god dude it's and, that shit hooks me and 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 like um with with damien coming on board uh, with Broken Hope when we came back and unfortunately after Joe passed away, Damien really committed himself to respecting Joe's vocal style and honoring it and working to this day his ass off to match that tone mm. and Damien has said many times he's like, I'll never fill Joe's shoes but I'll always work hard to match his tone the best I can, his vocal approach and everything. Even when we write, you know, new music, he's got Joe on the brain and and comes with that to with that angle to embody Joe's spirit, his guttural vocal style, and also just with pure respect and love. And it's a really great thing because that vocal style is a part of you know Broken Hope's stamp broken hopes brand you know we we, you know we couldn't come back with broken hope and have a vocalist that did sound like you know chuck schaldiner or something well that's that's it just doesn't it wouldn't work it would be like oh he's a sick vocalist but yeah but it's not sucks it's not broken hope you know know? yeah (laughs) that's like paul rogers singing for queen you know i don't Uh, yeah yeah there you go great great (laughs) Um, but that does invoke a curious question within deep within my dark soul um damien's fucking sick and he's filled you know the void who before you got him who were some of did you have like a hit list of like all right maybe i want to check this guy out or potentially go after this guy like was there anybody else other than damien on the brain yeah, there we had like uh we just had we had a short list at the time at the time when we were coming back like um 2011 when things were really being put together like okay we're definitely going to do this it's now or never if we don't do it we'll fucking never do it we started putting pieces together I was already jamming with our drummer Mike yeah who's with us to this day and we just needed to get the rest of the pieces together. Um, starting with Mike, by the way, like um, locally aside, I mean, you got to have an extremely sick, competent drummer. Drummer is really everything, right? Yeah. The, mm-hmm. and, and he scored a good one, and, didn't he? And, and he's a he's, local boy. He's he's worked. Yeah, local. Guys, and he's know, just yeah. he's just phenomenal. And. I'm really, I mean this unbiasedly, despite him being in my band and being my friend, but he just, Mike gets better and better and sicker and sicker. He just keeps honing his drum skills and he's, he's just fucking great. But anyway, um, we had a short list of vocalists and um, 
we I can't remember there was one guy he's from the west coast I honestly can't remember what band he's from our manager brought him to our attention but he we started talking to him things uh, heard some demo stuff was good but he got in trouble with the law he oh. wouldn't be able to tour yeah or nothing so and we were gonna we we're already slated to come back in 2012 right out of the box opening as direct support the obituary on this tour right so this is 2011 so we're like okay that guy's out damien from gorgasm was on the list um i even for a while there was talking to uh i was talking to john gallagher i, I was uh, gonna again. ask because yeah that, yeah that's whew. and he God. was up for it and and um shit we were we were talking like every other week but just with his schedule with dying fetus would be hard to pull stuff, off it didn't work out so ultimately out of whatever those five um damien one he's from was in indiana and he right. hoosiers up in this brutal he came game. He, he came up and uh jammed with us for a weekend stay at my house and it was like fuck the it really is it that easy and it yeah. was it worked out fantastic did we just become during, best friends during that first tour though um damien had some issues where we didn't think he'd get into canada and we had to do mm. some canadian dates so we just took steps not to have him at the time go to Canada. We had a guy from Canada fill in on vocals. Mike DeSalvo? <laughs> uh, Chuck Labossier was his name. What, that, that sounds, and, who's he in? Who's... And, and he, uh, I don't know what bands he's in. Our management company, again, are the ones who found him. Got and him. he was fucking phenomenal. There's videos on YouTube, I think you can see, of him singing with us. His onstage banter was just great. Like the way he introduced songs, you know, like, uh, you know, Preacher of Sodomy or something like, you know, this next song is about, you know, those Catholic pedophile priests. When you sit on their lap, they got a little surprise for you under the like really sick fucking <laughs> onstage banter, fucking crazy over the top. But it was so entertaining. Like, wow, this guy's great. But his vocal delivery was phenomenal. And like God forbid anything happened to Damien, that would be the guy I'd put in the band. He he was fantastic. But he was off our radar back when we were putting the band together. But right. I just like to mention him because Chuck, wherever you are, he's just he's just fantastic. So um, uh, but yeah, all the pieces came together and 2012. We did the, uh, that marked like we would have been on hey, it's just about 10 years and we were back. We had that North American tour with Obituary, uh, Jungle Rot, Decrepit Birth. Um, it was an awesome tour. And then we were doing some European dates and stuff. But right around that same time, we also signed to Century Media Records. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we already started writing omen of disease and that came out the year after Did you guys we've just been going ever since really out of curiosity because there was that relationship with uh you know the previous records um with metal blade was that something that you you or brian slagle maybe no one reached out there to see like if there you know, would at, still be that at, at the time we didn't have uh you know metal blade wasn't on on our, our radar you know um Again, not that they weren't on our radar, because I was still connected here and there with Brian Slagle, uh, Tracy Vera from Metal Blade. Sometimes I talked to Michael Faley from Metal Blade. Um, like the old crew from the 90s outside of them were, were gone. Like, you know, the guy who had signed Broken Hope, Marco Barbieri, he was gone. He actually, Marco went to Century Media uh, and he'd been there for years. So, um, so one of the things that, um, I don't know it, what do you call it? Business and, and politics was yeah, yeah. 
Century Media was one of the labels that just had popped up right away with interest to our management company. So um, it just kind of fell into place, really, you know. But um, when it comes to Metal Blade now, um, I'm probably closer to Metal Blade than I've been in a long time. Brian Slagle is a really dear friend of mine. Tracy Vera from Metal Blade, she's like my big sister. She's family. She's really tight with my wife and I. Mm. Um, and I'm working with them on on a, a big project. Uh, I can tell your viewers, actually, that, that has been talked about for but now it's happening. We're going to we're redoing the entire Broken Hope catalog. Ah, with, I was going to ask. Metal Blade, including, yes. including Grotesque Blessings. Fuck which yeah. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a Metal Don't Blade. Don't just sit album. there. Fuck my face. You know, <laughs> it was, yeah, you know it. Fuck okay, it. And, uh. Um, so what the plan is to like, <clears throat> want to, we'd like, want to remaster all the albums. I'm working with Brian Griffin on getting the master tapes and, and really doing shit the right way. Um, you know, beefing up the packaging and making a re-releases across the board, the whole catalog, just absolutely stellar. There's some titles, Metal Blade has had actually out of print for a while so yeah. um and then some titles that weren't like done domestically and even in vinyl and stuff so gonna do like, everything. you weren't even like grotesque you weren't even you guys were on uh what was that martyr music yeah 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 they did it on vinyl in europe but not not in the u.s so I now those, those titles that. have been licensed to foreign territories here and there and the, the licensees have um, get, you know, gone ahead and done vinyl versions, but we're doing it all, you know, band controlled. Uh, I'm directly involved and in working on that with Metal Blade. And then this summer we're recording a new Broken Hope album. Fuck yeah. Which, not, we did two albums for Century Media. We're done with that. And uh, what I ideally like to see is have the new album come out on Metal Blade Records, because just not only the history with Metal Blade, but again, their whole staff over there, aside, again, from Brian Slagle being a really dear friend of mine, Tracy Vera being family, there's a lot of people on the staff now who Tracy's brought in who are amazing at what they do, but they're also just practically family to me as well. And that goes a long way. You know, yeah, I've been on enough labels to know that you don't get a lot of people who give a fuck, really. You get it's business, you know, they mm -hmm. turn out music and bands and Metal Blade is a really rare exception. A label that is emotionally, and passionately into the friggin' bands like any band on Metal Blade, like the whole the whole crew over there kind of has to be into the bands you know before they sign anyone or whatever and it's just great man and um so ideally I'd like to come back to metal way with the new album so we'll see what happens but no matter what um i'm my plan is i i've got the means we're going to record the album i'm making that happen and then we'll take it from there but yeah I've got nine new songs written. Damien has got, I think, about three or four. So we pretty much have about an album's worth of material, pretty much. So we just got to hammer it out. We've got coming up next month. We 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 have to rehearse for Milwaukee Metal Fest. Yeah, Milwaukee. They're bringing back Milwaukee, yeah. dude. That's, and um, and that's we should awesome. talk about that here in a second. Yeah. Um. Because you guys got a history with Milwaukee, and, too, uh, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that. Um, and I also had a, 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 a side project that's been around forever, but has only done like an EP and hasn't done anything else, which is the band Earthburner. Yes. <laughs> okay, yep, yep. An extreme Brian Core band. It's basically, Look, uh, for me, Terrorizer of World Downfall worship, which Terrorizer World mm -hmm. Downfall. Fuck yeah. One of my favorite albums of all time. And 
I always wanted to do like a real grindcore album, you know, Broken Hope's got elements of grind with blast beats and, and stuff. And I love, I love that. Um, but of course, you know, we mix it up with heavy riffs and this and that, but I always wanted to do something that's really crusty, raw and super fucking grinding and blah, blah, blah. So Earthburner was always supposed to be that. Well, we have an album's worth of Earthburner material. We're actually going to record an Earthburner album uh, at the end of this month, the whole fucking album. So if I didn't have enough on my plate, <laughs> right, I right. got that going on. So the plan is this. Two weeks, record the Earthburner album. Um, we're just going to get the music done. We'll do the vocals in June. Um, I go back up north to Chicago land, start rehearsing with Broken Hope just for Milwaukee Metal Fest. After we play Milwaukee Metal Fest, um, that's on Memorial Day weekend. We play May 28th. After that, as soon as June rolls around, aside from getting these vocals done for the Earthburner thing, starting in June, the band is just going to concentrate on all these new Broken Hope songs that we've, you know, like I've written mine with Mike, our drummer, Damien and Mike have worked on his. So we all need to get together, learn all the songs. I got to write lyrics for everything too, but that's going to be job one. We all learn them, get them done. And by late summer, ideally get in the studio and get this new broken hope album done. That's dude. Drop, that's drop the massive term. loads upon the masses, right man. That's what no. it's all about, man. It's a but, love it. the beast. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, uh, one more thing I want to ask you real quick too. Yeah. Cause I want to go into Milwaukee. Um, uh, the fucking re-releases you're talking about. Cause I was thinking about this today. I'm like, man, it would be so cool. There's got to be fucking because you see like all these there's some badass like old school corpse bootlegs like at the Metro in 92, you know, like bleeding air and shit like soundboard recordings are just brutal as yeah. fucking shit. There's do you have any of these tapes? Uh, is there any plans to maybe do like a live DVD set or anything like some old shit with Joe, you know, because the well, technology and everything's there. Well, now you bring it up, Justin. I've got this grand idea that uh, I'm going to probably have to. I talk about this with Metal Blade. Let me just tell my money. Talking about the doing all the re releases. I'm like, well, let's do. Um, why don't we do a fucking sick limited edition box set thing? And Metal Blade were like, well, you know something like that's you know really costly and you know not ever you know not it's not like they would sell your people, shit dude people that buy the live joe album pe the people only live that buy, joe people that buy albums don't Lots. might not all buy the box set but but check it out um i i don't i don't care about you know uh who may or may not buy it i'm probably uh, my plan is this um, and I, I just got to see it through, but what I'm thinking is I'm going to self-finance this special box, right? That either would be called the grind box, which would be, you know, as a broken hope song Apropos. Or, or the, or the broken box. And what it would be is every broken hope studio album, we would have the live album, um, <clears throat> from uh 2015 live disease yeah um all the dvds so the documentary dvd uh the live at brutal assault concert dvd the live um at obscene extreme dvd and then um uh the demo all the demo tapes like remastered and done uh, every, every broken hope demo and then um i've got in my, I'm like the keeper of the fucking Broken Hope archives. I've got every what photo, got? Yeah, ever you? ever since day one of every every band member, every photo shoot, live shots. But I also have all these fucking recordings. I have some more recordings, like even before Swamp and Gore. Oh. I've got um, wow. I've got professional soundboard recordings from tours and everything. So like, uh, like. 
think about back in the day metallica had that fucking live binge and purge thing. Yeah. <laughs> every, yeah, yeah, yeah. every fucking thing you could ever think of all these right. live show you know it's like that's my vision to put that together and then like you know include some some cool ar- artifacts and shit and maybe do like a thousand of them limited edition num signed and numbered Dude, so I'm that's cool. part of my plan because I'd like to um give something like that to the fans, anyone who's that hardcore, you know. Um, and in like that DVD, you know, beef the I mean, the documentary DVD, you know, beefing that up, kind of like updating it now up, you know, to 30 some years of broken hope and, and with with more current footage you know we've had the same consistent lineup thankfully since 2014 and um it's it's we we've done so much cool shit and and again there's videos there's and and again and and going in the past there's that that 90s era broken hope you know the original uh, line i mean i got so much stuff and uh i'd love to share it with with fans so anyway that's this uh grand idea i have and i'll definitely make it happen i just got to get get it all together hell yeah even and dude and like i said the digital age like something like that if that was a kickstarter or something i mean dude i all you gotta do is share that shit you guys you, know, you guys are yeah that too. You, you know fucking fuck legends you know i mean yeah. that, i want to include shit like a fucking i want to do all all the releases for that thing like it would be a big fucking monster because it would be like <laughs> vinyl version of every album fucking vinyl of of all the demos on an album uh you know broken out flag i don't know fucking all kinds of stuff you know <laughs> but just yeah. uh you know just even outtakes of you know joe in the studio just isolated vocals you know <laughs> <laughs> like you know what i mean so yes Broken Hope, I always say Broken Hope's my baby. So, like, anyone who loves their their baby, their child, they, you know, one, I, I save everything for my baby, every photo, everything we've ever done. And I've also, uh, I want the best for my baby at Broken yeah. Hope. And I want to do all kinds of shit, you know. Well, you got other babies as well, and I want to break into that here. But real quick, um, God, I fucking lost my train of thought, so we'll just come back to it. I'll circle back. Um, but oh no, here we go. Kirk Hammett, dude, you were talking about Metallica and shit, and you got dude, there's this thing about you. You're you got so much shit going on, not just the band. Like I said, we're uh gonna talk about the books and shit, but how the fuck did you get like you and Kirk are fucking boys, right? Yeah, Kirk's a friend of mine. He like to call my my big brother. I always call anyone older than me. <laughs> At this stage of the game, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, going towards 53 now. I can't fucking believe it. But anyone, yeah, right? We're still here. Anyone man. older than me that are 60 years old or so, like Kirk Hammett, Charlie Benante, of Anthrax, he's one of my best friends. These no guys shit. are 60. So I always call them my big brothers, Eddie, you know, to make myself feel young. <laughs> well, but, a couple of hot Yeah, just, right? um, uh, you know, Kirk and I, we bonded years ago over um, th- similar things we love in uh, horror, uh, art, yeah, big you know, guitars and shit. And yeah. just, uh, yeah, it just kind of happened, you know. And uh, same with Charlie and I, you know, like I um, met Charlie so many times and I knew he, like, specifically too with Jaws, like, that's his favorite movie. And, and mine, my favorite is Jaws and the Thing, but Jaws, him and I, I always wanted to connect with him over Jaws. And every time I met him in the past, I'd feel silly, like, oh, this guy probably thinks I'm a fucking fanboy because I'd be like, hey, Charlie, you don't <laughs> want, Mark. You like Jaws. I like Jaws too, man. And <laughs> so fucking like, I'm like, ah, this guy, you know, but uh, we ended up connecting. And um, yeah, it's just one of those. What are those things, you know, but uh, yeah, man, Kirk, he's fucking cool as fuck, man. I mean, he's like, um, if uh, have you guys ever met him? Never met him. Oh, no. uh, because 
he's like bridge that gap. He's just as down to earth and fucking cool as you can get, man. He just always seemed like the coolest guy. dude from the band, dude. Like like he's, the, the horror the, connection, all that shit, dude. Yeah, and he, he just was into he's the, like he grew his hair back first. You know, he's <laughs> like uh, he's like any of us that you know are into what we're into. Uh, at, as even as we get older, you know, you're in the wrestling. And shit, you know. Hey, don't be talking Same. shit now, Jeremy. Same, you don't <laughs> you're in Florida. No, hey man, you're in your past. on the bruiser, it, man. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, it's all about harboring mm. that fucking love you've always had for something. Yeah, that's how Kirk is. But we're just horror kids, you know. Yeah, dude, that, oh, yeah, that's dude. so fucking cool. I mean, and how? What is the feeling? I mean, like you said, growing up and finding Metallica, and they're the ones that really start your career for you because that's you know from what you tell us earlier that's what fucking kicked it off and made you want to get into like some yeah right the lightning really is what made me go fuck i gotta i want to fucking do this arguably the biggest metal band in the world if not ever i like to think black sabbath's up there but you know if you want to talk about i mean sales and whatever it's 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 so before it's you know sort of surreal i mean it's kind of like i'm sure Kirk felt about hanging out and jamming with Michael Shanker, who's yeah, far yeah, guy, dude. who he worships. You Fuck know, yeah, I mean, dude. like it's uh, it's like wow, you know, I never saw this coming, but life is <laughs> funny like that. But uh, you know, it's like um, uh, it, you know, you that people mean certain things to certain people. You know what right, I mean, right. like. You could meet, uh, like, again, I'll use a wrestling analogy. Say if you, you know, I don't know who your your big wrestling guys are that you really worship. You know, like if it was the ultimate warrior, say, or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, Greg DiBiase, some old school guy. Something where you're like, wow, this fucking I watch you on, you know, USA TV on fucking Sundays, man. Fucking I can't believe you know, you and I are grilling out together and having a beer, like to someone else, it might be like, Oh, who cares? You know, fuck whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's what that person means to you. But at the end of the day, um, you know, man, it's all about like taking a step back, being like, we're all fucking uh, human beings. And there are, you know, part of it is surreal, but um, it's just cool connecting you know the whole fucking whole thing about you know never meet your heroes. Yeah, there's some heroes I met that fucking really disappointed me, man. For I real, there. Was, there was a reason behind mm-hmm. that saying, like, "Wow, you damn near pretty much ruined your entire discography for me and everything yeah. else." Because you're a fucking ass. It's in an instant too. You know? That sucks. Yeah, but then you get guys like you know Kirk and again Charlie Benante who. Um, meant a lot to me musically growing up. And then as an adult, being friends with them is just like, you know, fucking these guys and me are cut from the same cloth and they're they're just brothers. And yeah. and thankfully, they're just fucking got down to earth good people, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's Midwest like, making that East like West that, Coast you know? connection. Yeah. <laughs> so, and hey, speaking of wrestling really quick, I want to, since that's part of your whole getup. I want to get share this with you. Um, I used to really be in the wrestling when I was. I know. I, I could tell you I were was, talking about. You mentioned USA and Saturday, you know, Sunday yeah, night. Yeah, <laughs> I was. I was uh, watching you around those same years when I was 12, 13, 14, getting in the heavy metal. I also nasty sad. On K- I, I also I had cable TV for the first time. Then before you know, before by the time I was thirteen, I finally had cable. Before that, it was like living in the country with a black and white TV that got yeah. maybe four or five channels with the rabbit ears. So with cable TV, all these uh, channels and everything brought all these new doors. And I'll tell you, dude, I fucking would watch. WWF wrestling USA network and man mean Gene Okerlund I love them Gene Okerlund um I sometimes go down rabbit holes on uh YouTube because man I would laugh so fucking hard I still do to this day (laughs) 
the interviews me and Gene would do were priceless. <laughs> and when you'd get, you know, um, Macho Man, who fucking was on another planet sometimes, dude. I just please, couldn't get enough of it. Please, yeah. My guitar player, Matt Schlotka, lead guitarist of Broken Hope, does the fucking most perfect macho man <laughs> impersonation ever. He makes me laugh so hard, tears just roll down my cheek. And he fucking I made mean, Mike Tyson <laughs> laugh too macho man. But um, I'll tell you... Um, and 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 I got I was so in the re- in the wrestling, um, professional wrestling at one point. Again, I'm like 12, 13, going on 14. I like would buy wrestling magazines at the at the bookstore in Stevens. Yeah, you did. And uh like they like because they would have, I don't even know if they have them what they're like, if they have them now, but they had guys like on the cover with fucking blood and shit. I'm like, wow, look yeah. at this shit, oh, yeah. you know, like. It was like uh, that shit was brutal, but uh, <laughs> a favorite, my favorite fucking uh, wrestlers. I I do I do love uh, Macho Man. Did his name. He was he's up there, just a unique character. Um, there's kind of a hindsight thing too, like because I I got uh, away, you know, I didn't follow wrestling or uh, stick with it since I was young, but wrestlers who came along became big and then went away um later i kind of went back to discover what they were all about and uh like the ultimate warrior i discovered later in life after the fact and like i really got a kick out of watching him wrestle and do uh you know do his interviews and stuff but but at the time at that golden age, like when I, if it, you know, there's been different golden ages of wrestling, I guess. But no, yeah, you're right. That that, that early, was early '80s, early to mid '80s. Yes. Um, when I was watching it, like, um, dude, my favorite fucking wrestlers, dude, were were the Road Warriors. Yes. Fuck yes. Fuck because yeah. so fucking brutal. Those guys. Um, Best one, ever. My favorite movie at the time, at age 12 and 13, was the Road Warrior. Period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The fact that these guys were, you know, um, walking, living, they, breathing they, they death named, machines. You know, uh, hey, Jeremy, check it out real quick, not to cut you off, but we snack on danger and we die on death. <laughs> <laughs> what are the names? Hawk and Animal. Animal, yeah. right? Precious Paul yep. Ellering. Dude, I met oh, an yeah. animal a couple years oh. ago and it, he he let me put the pads on and I fucking jizzed oh, really? on myself. Oh, that, that's awesome. And I was also, uh, when I was a teenager, really into like uh, bodybuilding and shit, right? So uh, not that I was a bodybuilder. I was skinny as a fucking pencil. <laughs> and I didn't actually start really working out and hitting weights hard, hard till later. But like I knew every like I just knew all these nerd uh, like workout stuff, like the mu- parts of the body that had muscles. And I was always like, you know, the Road Warriors, like, they're fucking traps and shit were, like, fucking... Like, legendary. Like, they, like, these motherfuckers are, like, I don't know what kind of... Talk about, you know, juice podcast. I don't know what they were... <laughs> <doing>. <laughs> Those fuckers were... They were getting juice. I mean, I'm like, these Many motherfuckers meanings, are ripped, like, they're tra- like, shit like that, you know? Uh, but, um... And, Guys, then, they, and they um, were legit, oh, dude. They'd fuck you They were up. legit... And then, um, um, hang on, I'm trying to think of, um, god damn it, there was, there's all these, uh, these other wrestlers I like. Give me, give me some hints of their likenesses. Uh, All right, so, um, this guy's still alive, and he, uh, (laughs) he always had kind of long, dark hair, it was always wet. Bret Hart. Bret Hart, thank you, Bret. Bret, (laughs) And then, um. Like, remember that manager type guy they had? The, Jimmy Hart. Uh, hey, Jimmy baby. Hart. Yeah, What's up, yeah. baby? Yeah. Yeah. Just that whole, that whole class, like, fucking. Yes. Yeah. I still that have generation. A, I still just, have a, a real fondness for that shit, man. Just, uh, it's great. I just wanted to share that with you just because it's woven into your podcast or whatnot. Your genus apparatus, um, if you will. I'm uh, trying to give you, uh, add some, uh, 
Jeremy Wagner, somewhat legit uh, <laughs> wrestling history to uh, what extent I have of it. Thanks. Uh, you just created some you nailed it, it, brother. So, you know, so yeah. Pro wrestling the podcast. Yeah. I really Her love theme that. song's a banger. Banger. <laughs> banger. Banger. <laughs> Bang energy is. drink. Whatever. So with that, Justin, I hope you don't send uh bruiser Bodie oh, no. kick my ass and body <laughs> plan me for uh, <laughs> any infractions that I may have done on your show. Oh no. By no means, brother. By no means. Nope, you're you were talking about Jaws earlier. And, uh, dude, there's like, I, I've seen like, there's some major outlets. Like, didn't Forbes or somebody do some shit? Like, what's going on down in Florida with you and like Charlie and this whole connection to the movie Jaws? Oh, that was for um, the Daily Jaws you're thinking of, that feature that. We I've did. seen like a couple different ones, man. Yeah, it it got picked up by all these other press entities once once it went out. But the Daily Jaws, the world's biggest Jaws fan site, had the exclusive. <laughs> and what it was is it's um it's a three part video special. I have up up in my Chicagoland home. I have a Jaws museum. All right, <laughs> so. I've got some, kick it sometime, brother. I've, I've got some forward. screen used Jaws props from the movie. Like I've got Quint, the actual machete Quint had on the orca. I've got one of the yellow barrels. Yes. And I've got I've got a bunch of different shit. But part of the part of that Jaws special was an a special unveiling. I had a life size Quint built. And it's Quint from the movie Jaws. Hyper realistic, looks Holy just like him. Damn. And it's from the scene at the beginning. Of, the first time you see Quint, when the Amity uh, town leaders meet up uh, in, in a town hall meeting to discuss, we need to get someone to kill this fucking killer shark. Who's going to do it? And then you hear the nails going down the chalkboard and everyone turns around and there's Quint and he's sitting next to a chalkboard with a, a, a chalkboard sketch of a shark with a stick figure man in its mouth and says, I'll catch this bird for you and blah, blah, blah. And so a cold Nagasaki. I, or- I, so I would advise, look that up, Jeremy Wagner, Jaws unveiling, because you get, you'll, you'll see uh, this Jaws sculpt, the, the Quint sculpt with the chalkboard. And then you get a tour of my, Jaws Museum, but Charlie Benante, again, who's one of my best friends and also one of the biggest Jaws fans I know, um, we did a, a Jaws, like a metal, we called it the Jaws Metal Summit. So it was Charlie Benante, uh, Nick Mara, he's a legendary Hollywood effects guy who built the Quint for me. Nice. Uh, also a super huge Jaws fan. That's his favorite movie and myself and we're sitting there just talking about all things jaws so um just yeah google it or go to the daily jaws uh, youtube channel and you can find it there but it's like a three part video thing um with yeah just insane jaws fan shit <laughs> fuck yeah i would watch that uh... What other, um, do you collect any other horror like movie use memorabilia or anything like that? Yeah, I do. I, uh, with some of your prize pieces, the, the movie, the movie, The Thing, yes, John, Car- John Carpenter's The Thing, yes, is uh, also it's like that and Jaws are pretty much fucking even. Like, I, I worship both movies, um, and I've got uh, everything from every poster. From every country that ever made a, a thing poster. Um, if you know the movie The Thing well, in the beginning of the movie, it opens up with these two Norwegian guys chasing the dog across the glacier, trying to shoot it because the mm-hmm. dog is the thing. And then when they land, uh, they go to blow, throw a grenade at the dog, but it, the grenade slips out of the guy's hand and blows up the hel- Norwegian helicopter. So, like, I got the fucking rotor from the Norwegian helicopter yes. for one. And then I've got um I've got all kinds of little pieces from summer screen use, summer production use from the movie. 
The thing about Jaws and the Thing, 1970s, early 80s, these two movies, 75, 82. Back in the day, no one gave a fuck about movie memorabilia. Yeah, they just movie throw memorabilia, memorabilia away. Sells for a fortune. They got huge fucking auctions all the time, every year yeah. selling memorabilia now. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, they'd finish filming a movie. All right, that's a wrap. We're done. Oh, what, what should we do with all these props and stage shit? Ah, throw them in the fucking dumpster or just leave me or who gives a fuck? Someone will clean it up. Like <laughs> so much shit has yeah. been lost because of people back in the day not caring. So what pieces I do have, I'm real lucky to have that someone had the wherewithal to hang on to them or whatever. And then one day go, oh shit, you know, we'll, we'll sell this. But um yeah, I've got all kinds of stuff uh, from from the thing from Jaws. Again, when I say all kinds of stuff, the screen used in production stuff, I have. There's definitely some crown jewels, if you will, um, and their crown jewels just either based on their their importance to the film or the fact that they're rare. Someone saved them, and you know whatever got them. But then. Um, you name it, I just, then it's miscellaneous stuff. I mean, I love so many different horror movies. Um, you know, sometimes it's just original or rare posters for a movie. You know, it could be anything. The anything like from like Evil uh, Dead or Reanimating? Um, nothing from Evil. The, the one cool thing related to Evil Dead that I have is an Italian poster uh, for Army of Darkness, and this poster, this poster is what's cool is it's Army of Darkness, so it's the third film, but like, and it's all it's in Italian, and but they use that skull with the eyes from Evil Dead Two, mm-hmm. really big, with some other shit. But this poster, no shit, man. I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. It's like 12 feet fucking long, <laughs> about Jesus. four feet high. And um, Holy shit. I, was, I did an appearance at Texas Frightmare Weekend some years ago after my last book, Rabbit Heart, came out. I did a signing. I, they gave me a table. They were really great to me. They were like, we want you to come down and we'll give you a table. So I had, I was there all weekend and I had all my books and then like Broken Hope CDs and shit and you know, a uh, tablecloth, you know, Jeremy Wagner, but you know, writer, <laughs> open hope guy. But Sam Raimi and oh. Chris Campbell were at Texas Frightmare Weekend. Mm. So I had that fucking poster and um oh, I got man. it signed by those guys. Oh. Really um the credit for the poster and getting that sign goes to my friend Ron Moore. Ron Moore is uh really cool dude he's uh one of the greatest mo- movie poster collectors in the world and a lot of his stuff leans towards um horror and, and sci-fi type of poster so <clears throat> he he's like kirk hammett's poster guy kirk hammett has got one of the greatest yeah he's got shit. Collection didn't he do a rare, gallery exhibit rare. or something yeah he's done a number of exhibits yeah um uh he did it was called it's alive and it was like the kurt kirk hammett horror collection and he had a bunch of his um horror movie posters some some are extremely rare like he's, he's, a, he's a big into like the old school horror too man like the yeah he's got ones. one of the mummy posters i think it's only one the only one or one of two in the world have ever that still exists he would and, be the guy to have uh, it, you know so his the guy who has helped him acquire and find a lot of these rare posters ron moore i met him through kirk and ron has gotten um gotten me a number of posters that um i wanted so anyway he had ron it really is the guy who had that army of darkness italian poster and um i'm like Dude, I, uh, I, what do you want for that poster? I, I got it. It's <laughs> awesome. And we ended up doing a, a trade. I had, um, I had two, ju- two 
of these giant The Thing subway posters back from 1982 when they came out. Ooh, nice. Super huge. So um, house. I think we just tra- I traded him the subway poster for the Army of Darkness. So anyway, Ron. I totally made out in that deal, Ron, by the way. Ron was, the Ron event. was at Texas Frightmare Weekend when I did my thing. He brought the poster, but... Um, Ron is also was in tight with the organizers of Texas Frightmare Weekend, mm. and he like got to the front of the line to meet Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell and got him got him signed. So, anyway, <clears throat> that whole spiel I told you about the posters, going back to you know what other horror memorabilia shit do I got? You know, I've got some stuff from Alien. I've got some uh, also the artist H.R. Giger is one of my favorite artists and. Mm-hmm. I've got some original Giger artwork and oh, some um, Giger sculptures and stuff. The original I, uh, Danzig fuck fucking yeah. Giger. I've got a, like um, uh, yep, he did that. He did, uh, and and Celtic Frost. Yeah. Too. In fact, Tanji Warrior uh, and H.R. Giger were very, very close. And I think, I think Tanji Warrior like is like the main guy for the Giger estate or something now mm. um, over in Switzerland. But um, like if you remember the movie Piranha, I've got yeah. like mm-hmm. one of the mo- the one of the piranhas from yeah. the yes. from the movie. That the original was original, like the seventies one. From the seventies, yeah. 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 And I like was, the the remakes they did. They were silly. They were fun. You know. Yeah, they're good. They're good. Um, and uh, yeah, so I it's just uh, the rest of this shit is just a mishmash of. Do you you don't happen to have anything goes my fancy Return of the Living Dead? Do you? No, I don't. Not yet. What's your thoughts on that one? Oh, I think it's a great movie. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> it's, it's one of my Take favorites. that screwdriver <laughs> out of my head. <laughs> yeah, get that damn screwdriver out I of love, my head. I, I, that's a great movie, man. Yes. I, I love that movie. Yeah. Dude, so we got the horror thing nailed down here um the heavy metal thing but you're also an author man you've written a couple books now this is horror stuff and i like uh i like the whole premise for like your uh first book the armageddon chord man like yeah. dude playing oh, yeah. the chords of the apocalypse essentially you know like um how did that come about do you have anything else like in the works as far as any new books or anything so the whole writing thing um you know, when I talk about, uh, especially Bruiser, knowing Wisconsin, you know, I when I was growing up in the country as a kid, uh, like there wasn't shit to do but use my imagination. And I had an overactive imagination, but I loved reading books a lot. And I started getting, I was a real avid reader. I just couldn't read enough. And I started going from kids books to like my mom's, you know, adult novels. (laughs) Jeremy, come on. What we're doing. Yeah. My mom, I'd be like, what's this mean, mom? She's like, I don't think you should be reading that. Mom, what's a German Shazza film. (laughs) So she, she, uh, she like, she bought, like gave me Jaws when it was in paperback, you know, that's Jaws love. But I was always writing short stories and stuff. And then, I just like writing came before music ever did for me. I've always been a writer really since grade school. Um, and, um, and, and then as I got older and kept working on writing, like I eventually started, started selling short stories and, you know, I wrote all the lyrics for broken hope pretty much since day one. And, um, and then, yeah, before the Armageddon court, I had my first novel, what I my starter novel, which I always say this, I, I it's like a band's demo tape. Right. When you have or in a band and you have your first demo, you think it's the fucking greatest thing in the world. And it, five years later, it's a lot of shit. You're like, man, you got a lot to work on. So <laughs> same with my first novel. But eventually right. I sold a short story to a major publisher, St. Martin's Press. That story came out and it got attention. That's how I I got my first book deal. I already had the Armageddon Court pretty much done. And publisher and agent asked, hey, do you are you working on anything right now? I'm like, yeah, I got this book, the Armageddon Court. Uh, and that's how that's how I got that. And then um 
that novel came out. I, I sold more short stories. And then my last novel, Rabbit Heart, came out. So now I've got two new books done that are coming out this next year. I'm working on another book now. I also, um, this past um, winter, I got hired to from a big production company to create and develop a TV series. So I wrote really a pilot awesome. script for a TV series that got the it got approved. And I I basically developed an overview of what happens in the first season, second, and third season. So now I'm and and then I I got a couple other opportunities. So I'm at so you're a fucking the, vampire and you I've been right there sleep. I, dude, <laughs> tell me about it, man. So many fucking irons in the fire. I'm actually trying to slow down so I'm not doing 10 things at once. You know, it's like when I, in the old days, when I had a day job, I don't know how fuck I ever found time to write and complete novels yeah. in my band because that careful what you wish for thing. I write full time here. This is, that's what I do. That's like my job. It's not broken hope. It's, it's writing novels and, and, and movie and TV scripts now. And, and it's great, but that careful what you wish for. Cause I had over the winter, I had a deadline for uh, one book I wrote is a memoir uh, for a famous chef named Curtis Duffy. That's, that's done. That's like fucking, Sons of Anarchy meets Anthony Bourdain, Kitchen Confidential. That guy's life story is fucking um, both how he grew up is fucking insane and how he achieved this monumental success is really inspiring. So I did that memoir, you know, a different kind of book for me. Really great exercise and flexing my writing skills because it's not a horror novel or dark fiction. Right, right. So I got that book done, but that had a deadline with the publisher. Um, I've got a new novel that's done, which is definitely Wagner brand fucked up, dark, motherfucking, <laughs> yes. nasty fucking fiction. That's coming out. And I had that TV script with an overview of three seasons. All three of those things had deadlines and they were all on my desk. I was fucking like, you know, I wouldn't want to go back to any of the shit day jobs working for the assholes I used to work for for anything. Dude, a job is a and, job. And I wish to be matter if it's do this. But but um that was like dude you're doing living your dream but you know what you need to tackle one writing project at a time. So now I got those off my desk. And to that end um aside from those scripts that I got hired to write and turned in Again, I've got two new books that will be coming out this next year, and I'm working on a brand new novel. I've also got another memoir project about a world. I got the memoirs of a World War II fighter pilot that were never published. The guy just because I'm a huge World War II nut, I'm real fascinated with mostly the European theater, um, D Day, the Third Reich. We're on the Eastern Front, the Holocaust. So my neighbor here in Miami Beach, 93-year-old widow, her husband was this fighter pilot, wrote his memoirs, found out I was in the World War II. Oh, you should read my husband wrote his memoirs before he died. I'm like, all right, I'd love to read them. Like, yeah, I am a World War II Don. I'm reading them. I'm like, like this fucking guy was in um <clears throat> like Operation Market Garden, the biggest air battle in Europe at the time in World War II. Uh, he found the this famous Nazi battleship that Churchill wanted to sink called the Tirpitz and found that, called it in, that got sunk. He, he was a POW in a German uh, POW camp. Plus, on top of it, he was Jewish. So he's terrified, wow. terrified about being captured by the Nazis. That's a whole other thing. Um, he and then the the camp he's in Stalag Luft three, which is the fit, most famous POW camp. That's the camp that they made this movie about. You might have heard about it. Uh, it's a classic. It's called The Great Escape with Steve McQueen. Yes, yeah. And 
Fuck yeah. So I'm like, do you know anything about your husband? Like the she's like, no, nah, I never really read the memoir. He did wait. I'm like, we fucked once or twice. That I'm was like, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I didn't care about the His memoir. So I just got laid. That was all. But anyway, so <laughs> like, well, I really want to write these memoirs and weave in some history. This is extraordinary. So anyway, yeah, I only mentioned all awesome. that because I'm working. That's one of my upcoming projects. I, again, I got a new novel. I'm about 125 pages into that finishing up. And then um, whatever, you know, I just you, got. You're going to dip other, your feet and stuff. get wet in some like graphic novel shit? <laughs> yeah. Um, like well, team up with uh, what's his name? Who's so, who's uh, locked? The dude does all the shit for Campbell, so, like that artist. Well, uh, that's dude. Let me tell you about graphic novels. This is a whole nother <laughs> story as if well, I was dumbasses out there that's comic books comic books graphic novels I have as if I wasn't busy enough I've got one I've got a production film production company right we've got okay. two documentary films that are in the can now they're being edited one uh one is um about that that chef I told you about, I wrote his memoir, Curtis Stuffy. This is a new documentary about him and the restaurant he has in Chicago called Ever Restaurant. And I have a documentary film in the can being edited about the great adult porn star Peter North. Nice. Ah, yeah. we, nice. We, Peter fucking uh, North. Wait till you see that film. He was um, he was he was exclusively uh involved in the whole thing it's it's an amazing film but not to be outdone by going T. On, T. But, but but i tt boys uh in the documentary oh yes oh no way <laughs> every That's classic awesome. just me my night there's uh me a number night. of classic uh porn stars who uh are in there christy canyon uh oh, shit right on again uh we've had camera. jasmine st Clair on the show we, tons of tons of Tons of people. We got all Adam Carolla's in it. Steel <laughs> Panther, the band Steel Panther. Yes, we got, we got all kinds of people. But anyway, the, about re, this is specific to graphic novels. I have a publishing company that's two years old called Dead Sky Publishing. So that's you. Okay, okay. we've been putting out um, um, novels short story collections mostly you know it's it's dark shit we got we have an imprint called death's head press so that does all horror and extreme horror and then dead sky publishing we still stick to dark stuff so we do thriller crime uh that kind of shit and then we do nonfiction of all times of all all kinds i mean and then we have a, a graphic novel and comic book line and starting in may we've got like 10 titles coming out with Damn. comic book series, graphic novels. We already had a couple come out with, um, there's a, an author, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Joel Lansdale. Joel Lansdale is a really well-known, legendary uh, author. He, uh, you might, if you know movies, I'll give you that. He wrote a movie you might know called Bubba Hotep. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Joel yes. Lansdale. So we did a Joel right. Lansdale graphic novel, but um, this thing on my like, we got the best artists and writers. Like this shit, you'll see. Oh, I mean, this stuff stands up to anything DC Marvel image does. Like it's it's that level of comic books graphic novels but you said the word graphic novel so you got me well yeah but <laughs> I mean, if you want to geek out for a second brother part of like, my wagner universe you know wagner world wagner verse well, you need steaks Wag, wagner's wagus you know you know <laughs> yeah you mentioned wagyu a couple times you like i know because I, I got meat on the breed i think it's i used to like it i think it's a little too fatty I'm a little shapely now. You know, I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm trying to work it off. Right. Wagyu is, is a too little fatty. fatty. It's a little, it's a little yeah, fatty. It's a little fatty. They always serve it at, you know, Nobu when I'm there, uh, Chef Duffy's restaurant. I got a whole education on on how they do it, man, from the origin of the cow to massaging it to the, you know, 
It's like wow. it, back in the day, you couldn't get that beach. shit. It was hard as hell to get. But uh, just curious because you dropped that a couple of times. I was wondering. <laughs> And uh, I love steak. Don't get me wrong. I know you're paying attention, man. Talk about but, um, food. It's uh, you know, but I get picky about steak. You know, That's yeah, dude. I uh, I, I've had some really bad runs outside of me cooking my own steak the last few times, and then finally I fucking got one out of the park, and I was like, yeah, thank God. First one was super raw. It wasn't even cooked and the girl's like what well, you can just take it home put it in your oven i'm like i want to fucking punch you in the face right now <laughs> yeah. like, is this a restaurant dollar fucking steak or whatever yeah 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 it's fucking stupid but you're yeah. talking about graphic novels and shit i mean growing up or anything is there any interest in the comic world for you at all like doing anything i i mean what's some of your favorite shit are you are you cool with comics is there oh, certain god. characters or story oh, god, yeah like, but i'll tell you my own time my all-time favorite comic book series is Faust by Tim Vigil and David Quinn. Have you ever seen Faust? The movie? No, fuck that movie. <laughs> Based on that movie. The movie was the shit. Dude, you want to see the most violent, sexually explicit fucking and top, top, top ranked artwork Go look at Foss, man. The comic yeah. books. No, I know the comics. We're done with this interview. Go Google Tim Vigil Foss. Just look at the imagery. It's the fucking best, dude. It is the best. That's my favorite, Foss. Now, I'm also into uh, another artist who did some great comics and graphic novels named Richard Corbin. If you're familiar with him. Mm. Um uh, there's another guy, Mark Schultz, who did a he did a series by, which I really love called Xenozoic Tales back in the 90s. It was just fantastic artwork. Um, and uh, I mean, I like lots of stuff. It just depends. You know, I'm, I'm picky. I'm not. I'm more big. the fancy. But who's like everybody's got to. I guess they don't have to. But because I'm fucking judgmental, maybe you do have to. Who Who's like your guy? If you had to say just your normal superhero fucking guy in comics, like your Spider-Mans, your Hulks, your Ghost Riders, whatever. Lobo. Oh, okay. It would be the following. Ghost Rider, for sure. Motorcycle Hero. Oh, and by the way, Bernie Wrightson, one of my favorite artists, he was a fantastic fucking comic book artist. Bernie Wrightson, totally awesome. Do you know Bernie Wrightson? He's the old school. The guy that first started on Ghost Rider, right? The first run in the 70s? He he might have been, he might have done the first one, actually. I don't know, but he did a lot of comic book art. Yeah. Um, but Ghost Rider, Daredevil, and um, there's certain villains I like, too, though. I really like Thanos. Oh, yeah. Every, oh, the Bodie's a fucking oh, mark yeah. for Thanos. That whole, Huge. His friends that over whole, here. Like, I that like whole the series about the, uh, um, what the fuck's it called? Where he goes to get all the. The Infinity all, Gauntlets, the Infinity Thank Gems. You, yeah. It's the Infinity Saga. The Infinity Saga. Yeah. I love that, man. So there you I go. Love that. There you go. Yeah. I worship that guy. <laughs> the guy I who was know. right in his own mind. You know, and nobody yeah, believed him. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that that there's an example of of some of my top stuff, I guess. You know, yeah. Very favorite nice. favorite comic artist. Uh, again, Bernie Wrightson, mm -hmm. Richard Corbin, uh, Mark Schultz, and favorite of all time, Tim Vigil. That's a very Kirby. eclectic mix. You know, like that. Yeah, Jack, classic guys like Jack Kirby uh, is always really great. You know. Big fan Jim any of the Cooper. 90s shit like McFarlane's or your Jim Lee's or anything? Um, McFarlane's stuff I like, you know. I didn't really follow a lot of his stuff, you know, Spawn and all that stuff, but no. Yeah. It was about it as was. good as in the theater as Faust was. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Faust was just like straight to DVD. <laughs> yeah, I think the dude, Roadrunner Records did the soundtrack to that movie. Yeah. Oh, no way. I yeah. don't think I knew that. Yeah. I was yeah. always wondering who did that one. 
but the the comic book man i'm done check that out you gotta check i gotta do well, i can give you guys a homework assignment after this interview which is to go online look up tim vigil foss again forget the movie the movie was based on the comic book but that comic book could never be done in a movie it would have to be rated quadruple X. <laughs> It'd be like a dynamite film or something. But the explicit sex and the gratuitous violence is married up with a brilliant goddamn story by this guy, David Quinn, in this next level artwork by Tim Vigil. That's absolutely beautiful. I even have... Um, original splash pages from from foss sweet that's like yeah. i'm a hardcore foss guy you ever think about getting I'm some serious. fucking broken art the artwork, done? the artwork and everything i mean guys it'll you'll see what i'm talking about have I you ever definitely reached out, out for like you know to get some broken hope fucking promotional shit or almar done uh, i did in the 90s he actually uh it, we when i i reached out to him we went back and forth. He was willing to do something. He, but he wouldn't do color. He only wanted to do black and white, and we needed color. I believe that band Baphomé that mm-hmm. got mm-hmm. Tim Vigil to do something for them. We went with Wes Benscoder. However, um, yeah, that dude's sick. Too. I have um, a piece that he did for me at. Oh, like he was coming to Chicago for like a Comic Con thing, and um, there's uh, it's like about eleven by seventeen, beautiful ink done, and it's a uh, it's a like a zombie woman corpse, and her her boobs hanging out, her dress is ripped. I like it, spooky. There's like flies flying around her crotch and shit. <laughs> It, and, and with a cartoon balloon, it says, Jeremy, me love you long time. So that's, <laughs> I have that in my yes. uh, love you forever. Tim Vigil collection. But he, he is not for the faint of heart. That's for, for sure. Right he, up my alley. Right. Check him out on Instagram. He's got he's awesome, man. He's just he's just fantastic. Jeremy, speaking of checking out Instagram and all that shit, right now, dude, it's been a killer conversation, a killer fucking hang. Um, let everybody know where they can check Broken Hope out. <clears throat> Excuse me, where they can check out your fucking books and every dude. You got Earthburner, you got new Broken Hope, you got new fucking novels, graphic novels, all this shit happening. Where can everybody find it at? So, um, I've got a new website just going up this week. Jeremy Wagner, wait, Jeremy X Wagner.com. Wagner's ribs. And that will be on a uh on this uh new new web design. It's launching this week. You can subscribe to my newsletter. I'm gonna start doing newsletters. There you can Jeremy X Wagner really across the board. So Jeremy Jeremy X Wagner.com, Instagram at Jeremy X Wagner, Twitter at Jeremy X Wagner. And then same with Facebook. And usually I try to update everything. And yeah, we've got Earthburner album being recorded at the end of this month. New Broken Hope album that we recorded this summer. And then on May 28th, Broken Hope is playing Milwaukee Metal Fest. Yes. Milwaukee Metal Fest it's best. is back in a huge way. The great Jamie Josta. He's the brain child behind bringing Milwaukee Metal Fest back. And I'll tell you, Jamie did it right. Jamie is weaving in the glory days of Milwaukee Metal Fest from years ago. For anyone who went to Metal Fest in the 90s, it was a destination. It was legendary. People still mm-hmm. talk about it today. Fucking Nazem at Milwaukee so Jamie Metal Fest. Oh my God. has been taking like old photos and artifacts from the from leading up to 2023's metal fest showing people what milwaukee mm-hmm. metal fest was all about years ago and he, he's doing that but at the same time he's delivered the sickest friggin' festival you'll see this year i mean there's three days of 
Uh, they really got some for bands. everybody. You though, got the heavyweight size, bands you know? like Biohazard, Anthrax. Yeah. You've got you know Lamb of God, Machine Head. But then you got all these sick bands like Immolation, mm-hmm. Deeds of Flesh, Sandwich Sugabog, yeah, Future Pile, Future Pile, called, Future Pile, my boy Sean, Racine, oh. Wisconsin. Fuck yeah, that's um, actually where I used to live. Was Racine, Wisconsin, and um, you know Misery Index, Deeds of Flesh, yeah, yeah. on and on and on. I mean, it's fucking Fuck great. Yeah. So Broken Hope is playing day three, the last day on Sunday, May twenty eighth. Uh, we're on the main stage. And uh, we're going to deliver fucking a little bit of every piece of Broken Hope's discography and cram it into, you know, 30 minutes or so and just unleash pure fucking hell. Boys, it's in Milwaukee. It's Broken Hope's backyard, right? The Midwest. Yep, exactly. Boom. We haven't played Metal Fest since, again, I don't know, it was 1999 or something. We played yep. Milwaukee Metal Fest in 2023. 20, it's so goddamn cool and uh shit man we're just so jazzed and again i salute jamie josta he is the guy who put all this together with his team and they fucking knocked it out of the park so that's where you can see broken hope next and Mm -hmm. it's coming up pretty soon so that's what we got going on by the way uh you know justin i should have we should have just hired you to do a fucking broken hole promo for Milwaukee Metal Fest with your uh, WWF WWE <laughs> delivery. Yes. Go, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. See broken hole. <laughs> see broken hole. Rip your fucking bowels out and throw it back up your fucking ass. <laughs> Dude, I'm down, man. You me up, send me an email. I'll, I'll fucking <laughs> send you a video. Yeah. So, um, get that hey guys, that cross brand. I hey. want to thank you for having me on the show really appreciate it don't cut it short yet because oh. i have one last question oh, oh sorry okay uh, oh man look at him flossing he's like brian cage we had brian cage i, I told you man i was in the, he was like was in the off for us. Body there it is oh. and <laughs> and was, body! arnold arnold said back in the day man posing is everything get your yep. pose you know so when i was younger i heard this rumor and i just want to know if this is true or not because the guys in slipknot um i mean Everybody heard like the demos back in the day after we first heard like the major shit, at least around these parts, you know. And it was like then you heard stories like you those talk dudes to, uh, used to book Slipknot Broken Hope. Demos? Did did Slipknot guys used to like clown or any of those dudes used to book you guys in shows out there back in the day? No, uh, Slipknot with Broken Hope is like like this loose. Like when our second album came out. Balls of Repugnance. We played Des Moines, Iowa, where Slipknot are from. And when we played there, um, I know this because the guys in the these guys in the band told me this to my face. Joey Jordison, Paul Gray, and Mick Thompson. At the time, I think they were just high school kids. Oh, yeah. Love Broken Hope, and they came to our show at a club called Harry Mary's. In mm-hmm. Point Iowa, they will, they will and it was unleashed. The band unleashed and broken hope. We were on tour. Oh again. man, nineteen ninety four. Kids are good. So, a few years later, you know, five years later, this band with nine guys and fucking masks and jumpsuits named Slipknot released their first album on Roadrunner Records. Yeah, and I remember when they came out. Um, I was like late 20, I was like 29, something like that going on 30. Um, I didn't think anything of them. I'd see them in magazines, but they were, they were out along with, you know, Lincoln park disturbed. Lin- Jerry K- <laughs> oh, so I'm like, oh, don't even I'm like, ah, oh. making me sick. Like I made the mistake. Of I, I I've learned over the years as I got older, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, don't have a knee jerk reaction. But back then, when I was younger, I'd be like, oh fuck this shit, these this is all that new metal shit. I'm not going to listen to it. Well, <laughs> they were the hardest our, of that new our, metal, our, though. Our, what? They were the hardest of that new metal. They were because that's. Well, I mean, I don't going. even you consider a new metal, metal. They 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 
their musicianship and the, I felt the songs they wrote. Uh, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. Carrie King was I, like, they'd be great if you'd stop rapping. <laughs> what I wanted to tell you is they, um, when they came out and I just wouldn't listen to them or anything because I dismissed them as being new metal uh, and I didn't even bother listening to them. So, which was really stupid. I should have, you know. Uh, check them out again don't judge a book by its cover but our publicist at metal blade goes you know that band slipknot who are everywhere uh they they just sold a million albums for on roadrunner they're like fucking blowing up um i'm like yeah what about them well the guys in the band keep dropping broken hope's name in interviews so i'm like huh then i'm like all right well, let me see. So I like open like a hip parader or fuck some magazine. I still got some hip. And parades. sure enough, like they're like, yeah, fuck it. We grew up listening to Broken Hope and another interview. Yeah, we fucking love Broken Hope, blah, blah, blah. So um, uh, I went. So I'm like, OK, I got to check these guys out. And um, I'll tell Bruiser, Scott Creekmore, our mutual yeah. friend. He's like, Jeremy, you got to fucking check out fucking Slipknot ain't bad, man. It was like right around the same time that my publicist was telling me that, oh, these guys are dropping Broken Hope's name in magazines and shit. So Scott's like, he had the first Slipknot album. He's like, check mm-hmm. them out. They got some really good riffs on here. And I listen, I'm like, fucking A. <laughs> yeah, they, they're not fucking bad. Like the riffs were legit. Like yeah, they were. I thought because of them wearing fucking masks and shit. Was ass backwards. I should have just. They thought it was just some just juggalos and like fuck this. Give him a chance. Who you know, whatever. Fuck the image. And I'm like, they're real good. And this tour came around called Tattoo of the Earth. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. So Slipknot headlined it. Slayer mm-hmm. were on it. Tons of fucking bands. Where the fuck was and, Broken Hope? And uh, I don't know. We weren't asked to do the tour. I don't know. But it was at that tour actually in Milwaukee. I saw the tour date at the the Eagles ballroom and I didn't know what Slipknot looked like without masks. So Mm -hmm. I was backstage and um, this fucking, I'm five foot three and this guy who's fucking a good head shorter than me comes running up to me. Hey, you're Jeremy from Broken Hope. I'm like, yeah, what's up, man? He's like, I'm Joey from Slipknot. I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? Like I said, I didn't know what these guys look like without mask on. And um, and then that same time, that same day, I met Paul, Paul Gray, and and Mick, and they're all like, yeah, fucking, you know, they just love Broken Hope, and we talked. And then uh, for so for a while there, I was like, for years, friends with Joe, Mick, and uh, Joey. Um, I Paul. Out of most, uh, out of all three, I probably talked to the most, kept in touch with Joey. Joey and I hung out here and there sometimes if he'd come to Chicago. And um, uh, I had a band called Lupara in between mm-hmm. when Coconut was on hiatus. And um, uh, Joey actually thanked me and Lupara on that Roadrunner United album that came out. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. Roadrunner yeah. Superstars. And then Mick, from Slipknot was in was in the video music video. That's right. Yeah, I so, remember that. Um, uh, so I got a lot of love for Mick, Joey, and, and Paul. I'm sorry, Joey and Paul aren't here. Those guys were. Yeah, cool, that's crazy. Cool to believe cool that as is. Fuck. Fuck uh, I really, dude. really love those guys. But Mick is still with us, and he uh, he's a sick fucking guitar player. And yeah. Uh, yeah, he is. and the album Iowa when it came out by that time. Um, was I was amazing. legitimately into Slipknot off the first album again. Thanks to Scott Creekmore, yeah, to my publicist at Metal Blade for going. These guys love Broken Hope. You should check out what they're about. And and when Iowa came out, Iowa, uh, to me, to this day, that's a great fucking album. I love that album. Yes, I do too. But not Iowa. I just one of the heaviest just, fucking albums. Fucking album. But anyway. <laughs> Justin, that with what you're wondering about what you heard, well, that's kind of the whatever relationship Slipknot and Broken Hope had. It's just really with Mick, Joey, and Paul, who are three great fucking dudes. 
true fucking death metal fans through and fucking mm-hmm. through. Yeah. Those well, it shows through and, the music. And, and um, yeah, just cool as fucking. You know, Paul Gray, you know, early on, he wrote most of that music, most of the Slipknot tunes. And um, he was definitely a fucking diehard death metal fan. And <laughs> let's say, uh, fate, let's throw it in there, Midwest. Come on. He's Iowa. Yep. Midwest. Fate, Broken yeah. Hope. Fuck yeah. Slipknot, Iowa, Illinois. Feel the dreams. And Bruce Feel the from Milwaukee. Yeah. Know? We got the trifecta yes, we do. of the states, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, uh, Iowa. So there you go. Indiana, so fuck you guys. And Oh, in Indiana? <laughs> how much you're on the tip? You're, <laughs> you're right there. Touching. We're touching. <laughs> we're touching. The we're docking touching dead. Tips. We're space docking. <laughs> the docking dead. Come on, space docking. Come on. <laughs> fuck yeah. Well, Jeremy, awesome. it's been a fucking blast. Thank you, yeah. everybody, for tuning in. Like, subscribe, share. If you're listening to any podcasting platform, be sure to rate and review and share. Ah, oh, you motherfuckers, Jeremy, Bodhi, Shred, let's get the fuck out of here. Until next time, the JP Dub, we're out of this motherfucker. <gasps>